pleased to welcome Reverend Dr. Tom Ballard to the pulpit to give us our message this morning. Thank you. I want to share with you the scripture which you have heard many times, many times at uh, funerals. The last part of it was very meaningful for us and uh, I want you to hear God's supportive word for us from the 8th chapter of Romans. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words, and God who searches the heart knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to His purpose. For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son in order that He might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom He predestined, He also called and those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of God in Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or ferment or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for our sake we are being killed all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let us pray. O oh Lord, we come here to hear your word, to be responsive to it. We pray for an openness on our part to you and your letters to us. Through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. I have um, preached in a number of Presbyterian churches, and I'll tell more at the communion table, but uh, I have introduced 13 Presbyterian churches to worship in a Jewish temple or synagogue on Friday night. And we have done this with, uh, well, the first time we did it in Sumter, South Carolina, watching, uh, well, the singing about the uh, escape and the wonderful lady who knew the way across the mountains to freedom away from Adolf Hitler and his troops. Well, later we saw the movie 
with our Jewish friends and then to the synagogue and then to our Presbyterian church uh, on Life is Beautiful. The first part of it is uh, funny. The husband and wife in the movie, in real life, our husband and wife, he's a comedian. And uh, they tell the story of the Holocaust. It's the only movie I can show in a church. Schindler's List, uh, The Pianist, those are just entirely too violent to show in church. The only violence that takes place in Life is Beautiful is off the camera. It has a positive ending about a father caring for his child and saving him from the horrors of the Holocaust. Well, such is life. I want to share with you the uh, message I think is important about who you are. I hope that through this sermon and the emphasis thereof, you will better understand who you are and how you operate in the world. Now, I'll mention a couple of things in the introduction to this uh, sermon, and I will share with you something from uh, a Lutheran pastor, he's dead now, uh, who was a good enough theologian to be a Presbyterian. <laughs> he was, uh, he wrote about the ways views of atonement. And he comes to an ending in the book which is quite helpful. So I want to share with you how uh, I came about this. I will be a little bit closer if I don't fall, which I'm holding on to be sure I don't. I wrote this sermon for Palm Sunday. Well, it wasn't for Palm Sunday. It was for the baptism of one of our grandchildren, Lena Ballard Rose, at Madison Avenue Presbyterian Church in New York City. So our son, who is an elder there and chair of three committees at Madison Avenue Presbyterian Church, insisted on me doing the baptism. Well, they had a team of five people from uh, Switzerland doing movies of her and her success. Her and four other people being successful from Zurich in New York City. So uh, it was that uh, the uh, baptism was held and filmed and we learned something about it. You who have been baptized into Christ are part of Jesus, who at the communion table is our living Lord present, who is with us and who includes us both as children of God and as Paul tells us, we are also adopted as the children of Abraham. John Calvin said it correctly. The Bible is whole cloth. It's not the old and the new. The revelation of God to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Israel is the revelation of God to us. All the confessions of faith in the Hebrew Scriptures, in the Tanakh, are ours as well. We are included. I want you to join me as we go to the 21st door story of where Lena lives. 
join us together as we go down from the 21st floor all the way down to the first floor, out the door, past the doorman, take a left, and take a left on the avenue. Remember, just me and my shadow walking down the avenue. Now there is a shadow, as long as there is a light source, that is always with you. It's your shadow. And it is God-given. But as you walk down the avenue, the light hits the uh, pane glass door windows and it makes other reflections. They're not as bright as uh, or dark as the main one, but they're there. Those of you who are teachers or been students, some of you have had the Myers-Briggs type indicator, started by Karl Marx, but it is uh, not a psychological test. It's mainly one that helps you understand your preference for behavior, helps you understand yourself, whether you're an introvert, an extrovert, whether you uh, or intuitive, you walk into a room, you get the picture of the whole thing. Or you have to go step by step. Also, it helps you understand whether you are thinking. The book says do this. Or you're a feeling person. And I can tell in session meetings when I know what I think. I can tell those who think, well, now the book says ABC, we need to do this. And those people who are elders from there who say, well, well, what will people think about this? So you have two different, well, you also can understand yourself. Now, there's another thing. The last one is of uh, judging or perceiving. Now, judging is not being judgmental. All of our family are J, judging. Not judgmental, but they plan. I plan, my wife plans, two of our sons plan. One of our sons, a musician, he flies by the seat of his britches. He is a musician and very smart. And he drove his music teachers crazy by not preparing totally for a meeting. But he won, won awards and, uh, in music and was star student and all that. So perceiving people can be very capable, but they may fail to do things. I taught college in uh, two, two colleges two seminaries. I told our sons, when you go to college, take your core curriculum first. Don't delay it. Well, two of our sons did it. Our perceiving son didn't do it. His last semester, there was one course required for graduation which he had not taken in his three and a half years and they did not offer the course. They offered it in the summer which meant no grants, no Pell grants. That meant money. And uh, so he did and but anyway, such was the life of that. Well, <clears throat> we also learned something about ourselves, not only from the Myers-Briggs, but a lot of tests help us to understand ourselves. But there is still something that is primary about us 
that's not separable from who we are and what we are. And so it is we discover as we live life. Well, I know as I have uh, taken some studies at the University of North Carolina, I took some graduate work in German, and the professor there introduced us to comparative linguistic studies, helping us to understand Middle High German and the early Indo-European language, which was never written. I already had Hebrew, and I understood the difference between Indo-European languages, you know, the Romance languages, uh, naturally, uh, French, Spanish, Portugal, and the Germanic languages. And uh, there's a difference between our background, English is a Indo-European language, between our language and that of the Hebrews. You think of uh, the Old Testament, the Tanakh, and what do you think about creation, the story in the garden, Daniel, Ezekiel, lions, men. You think of stories, Jonah in the belly of the fish. And uh, we know the stories. Well, it's not just the stories that convey see the Hebrew language does not suit itself to philosophical theological discussion so and you'll pardon me I'm going to have to have some water whatever it is in my life water escapes my mouth Well, not only is the language conveyed, theology conveyed, in story form, <laughs> like in the garden parable, there are even words that do the same thing. I know uh, as we think about it, the word sin, <laughs> You go uptown here and ask them in the street, what's sin? Ah, oh, that's being naughty, doing something you ought not to do. Well, the Hebrew is more dramatic and pictorial. One of the words, there are three of them that are primary translated into English as sin. Kata, Awan, and Peshan. And they portray, well, the Hebrews were familiar with bows, arrows, swords. So the first word talks about missing the mark. Well, missing the mark can be very bad. I've heard stories of people over and over again who have not only distorted their own lives, but those who have suffered post-traumatic syndrome from service, from abuse by an older person they trust as a child. I've talked with several like that. People who don't believe the Christian faith. I've talked with a lot of them. Some of them have become believers. They deny the existence of God. They miss the mark. It is from aiming too high, too low, or bing, 
Oh, I'm sorry. I missed the mark. And that uh, can be very devastating in human life when we who are created in the image of God miss it. Just absolutely miss it to the harm of innocent people. The next one now, the young people, younger people here know that. It's to be... Um, been out of shape, distorting, perverted, to be so perverted that we have lost our sense of what life is all about, what we are all about, and so sin becomes a matter of our being led astray. But the strongest word, the strongest word is Bashan. It is told in the garden story in that wonderful parable, and it conveys the truth there. Remember the temptation. If you eat this fruit, you will be like God. And that is the ultimate distortion and consequence of sin. Because you have eaten whatever it is, participated in wrongdoing, you have thought you have taken the place of God. You know what some theologians say about the real atheists? I've talked with a lot of atheists. Some of them have come to faith. The real sinners who deny God, some theologians say, is not those who deny deny the existence of God. Those people I've talked with who deny the existence of God talk a lot about God. The theologian said, the real atheist are those who count their money, their things, materialism, Remember the temptation. It will be attractive to your eyes. And if you partake of this, you will be like God. And so the real deniers of God, some theologians say, are those who live day to day, earning their living, not thinking about God, just thinking about survival. But there is something else that's not central in who we are. There's something else that's central in who we are. It was done when I baptized our granddaughter, Lena. Ballard Gross. She was baptized into Christ and baptized into the Hebrew faith, into Jesus, becoming thereby a child of God and also adopted as the child of Abraham. That's part of who we are. And that absolutely is inseparable. What can separate you from that shadow, the primary shadow that's always with you? As long as there's a source of light, you've got that shadow. As long as there's light, 
You are a child of God. And you always will be by the grace of God. Let us pray. Help us, O oh Lord, not to forget who we are and whose we are. We thank you for the baptism that includes us and for the words of our living Lord who makes us a child of God and a child of his own faith, the Hebrew faith. We thank you that we have something that is not divisible from us, but is always a part of us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You'll see in the bulletin the creed from a declaration of faith. Shirley Guthrie, one of our primary Presbyterian theologians and his committee wrote the Declaration of Faith. In the South, that's where he was at the time, it was never approved as a declaration or as a confession. But it is the most used and the least approved of our confessions of faith. Let us affirm our faith together. We grow in the new life. The Christian fellowship was not a society of perfect people. The struggle between the old way of life and the new was severe. Yes, the spirit produced among followers of Jesus love, joy, peace, victories in the battle against evil. We believe in the Holy Spirit works today. Wherever the believers grow toward maturity in Christ, as long as we live, we struggle with sin. But the Spirit's presence assures us God will complete what He has begun in us. <laughs>